Like many parts of the world, the UK property market has experienced a roller coaster ride of ups and downs this year as it absorbs the effects of COVID-19. While there was a total stop in transactions at the height of the pandemic, when the country first went into lockdown, the second half of the year saw mortgage applications and transactions surge on the back of Rishi Sunak's stamp duty holiday. Add in pent up demand and a desire for more space, along with an expected increase to stamp duty for overseas buyers in April next year. And it's easy to see why there's been a rise in interest from the Middle East. So how long will Britain's house price surge last? What should Middle East investors do to ensure they get the best deal? And what's driving the increased interest from the region? Welcome to Pocketful of Dirhams. I'm Alice Hayne from The National. And joining me today is Henry Fawn, partner and head of Knight Frank's Middle East private office. Welcome to the show, Henry. Alice, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, British house prices are on their strongest growth run since 2004, with the average home now selling for £253,000. That's according to Halifax. And there's literally been a flurry of activity here since Rishi Sunak announced his stamp duty land tax holiday on properties worth up to £500,000 in July. But has this also been a drive for interest from the Middle East as well? Great opening discussion there, Alice. Um, I would say yes, perhaps, in part. Now, the key point here is that the stamp duty holiday, which Rishi Sunak announced, is also applicable for overseas or international buyers coming into the UK, Alice. So that is certainly a key factor in recent demand. Um, Other key factors to consider here are also the attractiveness of the pound sterling versus other international baskets of currencies, for example, the US dollar peg currencies, of which most of those in the Middle East are. Sterling is still relatively quite attractive on a long-term basis. So I would say the two of those factored them together, build together many of much of the recent demand. You mainly deal with buyers looking for more expensive homes. So have you seen an in- surge in interest at that level as well and a rise in transactions since the end of the first lockdown? Interesting enough, we have done. I would actually say, let's have a look at this on a slightly broader basis from the beginning of 2020. We released some interesting research in our Super Prime London report, Alice, recently. And it looked at the first three months of 2020 versus 2019 and 2018. And actually, we found in the transactions above £10 million in central London, there was 30. Now, in 2019, there was only 18 and 2018, 22. So you can see already this year, there's been a huge surge at the very top end of the market. Post lockdown number one, we actually saw one of the busiest marketplaces we have ever seen. And many families had the time to reassess their lifestyles and perhaps found a requirement for more outside space, maybe having a home office to work from or even a space to homeschool the children if necessary. And therefore, their requirements for their real estate changed very quickly. So what types of inquiries are you receiving? Are people switching from apartments to sort of big country houses or are they still wanting to go off to London? Is that still the preferred destination? Now, from our clients coming from the Middle East and traveling to the UK, if they were perhaps staying there long term, uh, for several years, perhaps moving for work or otherwise, then yes, certainly a, a house with a garden or a bit of outside space would perhaps be in demand more. Um, still, I would find many of our clients do prefer the central areas of the cities and, and most predominantly London throughout that. Um, Second homes in the UK are are more in demand versus those that are looking for pure investment. And many like to travel to the UK, not just for holiday, but to send their children there for education. And if it's for a number of years, a family may prefer to purchase the property rather than rent the property for a longer period of time. And again, those requirements may vary, but it could be from central London houses all the way through to the country homes, as you suggested. And what is the kind of driver there? Why why is London in particular the kind of... What draws people in from the Middle East? Why do they want to come be in London? Now, London as a second home is not a new phenomenon for the wealthy clients from the Middle East. Um, For several generations, uh, Middle Eastern clients have been coming and enjoying everything that London and the UK has to offer, whether it's the green countryside, if they're not in the cities, or the central London ability to go shopping, the restaurants, the hotels that we have on offer there. Um, Naturally, English is a second language for many of those in the Middle East. So this lack of any language barrier makes the initial travel to the UK, maybe even just for studying, that much more accessible. And is it just London or, or do we see other areas that also attract that kind of interest? Is it the home counties of, let's say, Surrey or Hampshire or elsewhere in the country at all? What about Scotland? 
Now, outside of London, I would say the key areas that do have access to London within a reasonable either drive or a train are certainly also in, in good demand. The home counters, as you mentioned, perhaps North Surrey, maybe in a 45 minute or one hour drive, you can be in central London. Uh, beyond that, we often have clients, that perhaps if they're sending their children overseas for education, are looking at the key northern cities, Birmingham or Manchester, for example, or further afield north, even Edinburgh. Um, it's certainly a good place where many of our clients here, even from the UAE, do enjoy. To the south of England, um, for education, this is more specifically, Alice, I would say coastal locations like Bournemouth and Brighton are key locations for our UAE clients. And what kind of price level are we talking about here? I mean, we've talked about the, the kind of demand for more space, people wanting to find bigger houses with bigger gardens. So that if we go into another lo- lockdown, and who knows what might happen, even with the vaccine, you know, people want to have space to move around. So what kind of price level are, are you mainly dealing with? Generally speaking, I'm working with many clients from about £5 million and above. Um, This is certainly a a narrower point of the market, but the price point can vary. Now, in the central areas of London, Alice, prices can start from, say, just below £1 million and uh, extend effectively exponentially upwards, perhaps into the hundreds of millions for a single residential property. Whereas in the wider UK cities, let's take uh, Reading, for example, it has a quick access into the central London via train, maybe 25 minutes or half an hour or so. Yet a two-bedroom apartment you can pick up in Reading for around about £400,000. So relatively be very good value for a very small transfer out of the London. So some people are are buying at the lower end as well. It's not all hundreds of millions. Of course, Alice. I'm saying my my particular focus has been on the higher end more recently. But again, we have an offering that uh, tapers to all clients across the board. Now, the UK market has also been struggling since 2016, and, and it's not struggling so much this year. We have seen a surge in prices. But, you know, when the UK voted to leave the European Union, it did have a, an effect on um, on the market. And then we've we've got post-Brexit, the end of the post-Brexit transition period coming in soon. Do you think that's going to have another knock-on effect on prices? There have been two key I would say, cooling factors to discuss in the UK market in recent years. Uh, The first, as you say, is the result of the Brexit referendum vote. And the second is actually the closing costs, Alice, the stamp duty land tax. Um, This is the tax paid at one time upon closing a real estate and residential or even commercial transaction. And these actually also elevated a few years ago, just before the Brexit referendum, and it had a dampening effect on the market and arguably continues to do so. Now, the recent sentiment from our clients has actually been less focused and less concerned around Brexit. And they actually even feel that these days it's possible that UK trade with the GCC and the wider Middle East may even increase post-Brexit. So for now, we see, yes, there could be some lags, but, but on the whole, many of our Middle and Eastern clients are less concerned about Brexit now. So if they're not concerned about Brexit, then they must be concerned about the possible rise or increase of the stamp duty come April next year. Because as well as the stamp duty holiday coming to an end, we're looking at possibly a hike for overseas buyers. Do you think that'll have a knock-on effect? Yes. So stamp duty, as I mentioned, is a key factor here. Uh, Given that taxes across the board in the Middle East are a little bit lower than what we may have found in Europe, uh, when it comes to the UK and you're purchasing a property and perhaps the closing costs are anywhere from 5, 10, all the way up to 15% or above, Uh, to purchase the property, yes, it is uh, something that needs to be factored in. What I find, actually, Alice, is my clients will look at these and they'll say, okay, yes, there's an additional 1%, an additional 2% or whatever it might be in that circumstance. And they will change the horizon of what they're looking at that property for. So whereas they might have bought it for for three years for their child to study in the UK, maybe they'll hold the property for seven or eight years. And actually, when you take the tax an extra 2% over the course of seven or eight years, it makes relatively less difference for them. And that's how they make their peace with the relative taxes. So are you finding that some people are actually saying to you, look, I want to get this deal across the line before March 31st? Is there, is there a drive for that? A huge amount, both ways. Um, perhaps both new buyers that are coming to us now, Alice, and saying, look, we want to get it in now. Stamp duty is a little bit less, um, certainly up to the properties of, of £500,000, where you can make a £15,000 saving on the stamp. That's a, a good size saving um, to be had. Uh, but also clients that have bought previously from us and are looking to complete and have the properties handed over. They're looking to have them handed over before this time uh, to also benefit from the stamp duty saving. I would agree, yes. And of course, for those who've got a mortgage, I mean, there's a huge demand for mortgages at the moment. So that can slow the whole process down to some extent. So is there, and you've got to go through all the legal processes as well. So your clients are on your back all the time trying to get deals across the line? 
Both ways, perhaps, Alice. It might be that they're on my back trying to get deals across the line, or it might be that I'm on theirs as well, I think is probably a good way to look at it. Um, yes, so there's two factors you mentioned there were both the, the legal conveyance, the purchasing in actual of the real estate itself, and the mortgage. Um, a couple of factors that have been a little bit slower over the past summer. Um, one is getting a mortgage valuation. For example, during the first lockdown, when it was not possible for a valuer to inspect the property, whether it's a house or a flat or otherwise, we couldn't perhaps get a valuation done very quickly at all. And there was a backlog when the market reopened again and inspections could take place. The second factor you mentioned was the legal conveyance. I would say solicitors on hold have been working extremely effectively throughout both lockdowns. Um, I would say perhaps one that's taken a little bit longer is what we call the, the search conveyancing. So when there is a search, when we go to the local borough, the local council in London, whatever it might be, uh, and we find out a bit more about the legal background of this particular location, that has taken a little bit longer. Um, so perhaps where we would have taken maybe four weeks or six weeks to previously exchange contracts on a new property. Maybe that's eight or 10 weeks now, Alice. What's your outlook for the UK market next year? I mean, we've seen prices surge in the second half of this year, but it's all set against a backdrop of a very tough economic year for the UK. You know, COVID really has hit the country hard. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs. We're looking at unemployment figures of 7.5% by the middle of next year. So how will the property market react to all of this? Good question, Alice. I would say there's probably a couple of things to factor in here. Uh, one, is, of course, is the demand side, which you were mentioning there in terms of unemployment or otherwise increasing somewhat uh, over the coming year or so. Um, and the second one is perhaps more so to do with the interest rates for mortgages. Now, if we said demand-wise, yes, um, we still see demand continue, certainly in the key areas, London or otherwise, that will continue as or not as normal, but perhaps in a less down and down way. Um, certainly, if sterling remains as attractive as it is, and the key drivers behind why people buy from overseas in London will not be changing over this time. Um, secondly, I just saw a very interesting breakdown. I think it was Oxford Economics, Alice, who looked at this and they said, well, actually, realistically, we don't forecast any big crash or otherwise coming in the UK property market because that would only happen if uh, interest rates increased exponentially much higher. And therefore, mortgages can be paid off. Now, at the moment, as we've seen, they're being held at a record low. And it may even be the case that they come even lower down still, uh, which means that mortgages are at all-time most affordable rates. Uh, that We can see there's some fantastic deals to be had in the market. And actually, lending is very attractive in the UK for now, uh, with very little pressure on it. So for now, I see from those two factors there, things being quite steady over the coming years. So with that in mind, which areas do you think are going to fare particularly well, You know, particularly for buyers coming in from the Middle East? In the outer London areas, there's a few key places which we've already seen, Alice, have been particular hotspots. Um, these have been areas, for example, Wimbledon, um, Belsize Park uh, in the north, maybe even Dulwich in the southeast. And these are areas where perhaps you can still be in the central areas of London or have good access to those central areas, but you can actually have a house with a garden. And we've seen areas, for example, Wimbledon increasing in the three months to this past October, in the opening of the market, um, increasing 2% or so. Uh, Belsize Park, uh, maybe perhaps a little bit more, and Dulwich, the same amount. So we've already seen some small price increases in these particular areas. So I would say those are the sort of hotspots to look out for. These are houses that have good access to central London. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it's thrown up so many curveballs over this year. And yet the, the UK markets remain pretty resilient through all of that. Do you think you have to factor that in when you're looking forward? Yes, I would actually say there's probably two ways to look at this, Alice. Um, the key one I'd, I'd look at and we look at from a research perspective is that last time around in the previous global financial crisis, uh, the London market had been increasing uh, exponentially so from sort of 2009 to 2012 and into 2014, actually. And perhaps it increased 50 or, or 52% in the values. Now, coming into this time around, the global pandemic, Alice, We've not had the same increases. Actually, for example, central London, since, as we discussed previously, the Brexit referendum vote and the stamp duty tax changes, actually the market's cooled off in central London, perhaps in some areas to a tune of 15 or 20% has come off the capital values in recent years. Therefore, there's not that extra throth, so to speak, in, in the pricing built in. It's simply not there. So for that reason, we don't forecast uh, any big shocks coming in the London market. Now, also for a number of investors in the UAE, you do have a pool of people who like to hold on to a number of buy-to-let 
properties, probably at the lower end of the market sometimes, but I'm sure you also see clients with several at the high end of the market. What should their strategy be now going forward, particularly with possible changes to um, stamp duty and maybe capital gains tax in the future? You know, what, what should their strategy be? Well, generally speaking, if it's a more complex portfolio for a client, I would always recommend that they go and sit with their own tax advisor and and drum out a path that they think is correct at the moment at the current current tax landscape. Generally speaking, we've been advising our clients, depending on what it is, if there's any value add to be had in their properties, maybe they can add some value through refurbishment and increase their rental yields that way. Um, Or we could look at their portfolio and see if there's any other little aspects that we can assist on. Uh, whether it's extending the lease, if it's in London and the, the apartment rental the apartment lease has run down by a few years, that can also be extended. So those are two simple ways that we could look at it, uh, perhaps increasing the value of that portfolio. And for somebody who's thinking about entering the market right now, you know, they've, they've had this crazy year. They've possibly been one of the lucky ones who's managed to save a pot of cash because their outgoings have dramatically reduced and yet their income stayed the same. There are some of those lucky people out there. So what should their strategy be now if they want to enter the UK market? Should they wait and see if the market comes down or just go straight in there now? Good. Well, I always advise my clients to make all the possible research and educate themselves as well as possible before making a decision, um, such as this. As we know, real estate is perhaps one of the biggest investments that anyone will make during their lifetime. I would say perhaps this is relatively quite an attractive time. The UK, as we know, has just announced that it will be rolling out the vaccine across the UK, which is fantastic, first country to do so. Um, And secondly, it looks like, or is indicating as such, that the Brexit uh, agreement may be perhaps back on track again, which is fantastic. So the window of currency where it's still attractive for US dollar-pegged buyers, those coming from the Middle East, Alice, um, may be shortening if the pound increases somewhat in the coming few months. So I would say look out for the pound attraction, perhaps um, speak to their banker, look at look at the forex rates at the moment, and then look for good opportunities in the market, of which there are. And we can certainly guide our clients as to what is within their means uh, to find them a good opportunity in the location that they prefer. Thank you very much for joining me today, Henry. Thank you very much, Alice, for your time. Thank you this week to Henry Fawn. If you would like advice on your personal finance issues, you can write to me on pf at the national.ae. And remember, that's pf for personal finance. Please do subscribe to the podcast in your podcasting app to receive weekly updates. And also leave us a review so we know what you think. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison. I've been your host, Alice Haynes.